Section 1 of The Human Drift by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Human Drift. The revelations of devout and learned, who rose before us, and as prophets burned, are all but stories which awoke from sleep, they told their comrades, and to sleep returned. The history of civilization is a history of wandering, sword in hand, in search of food. In the misty younger world we catch glimpses of phantom races, rising, slaying, finding food, building rude civilizations, decaying, falling under the swords of stronger hands, and passing utterly away. Man, like any other animal, has roved over the earth seeking what he might devour, and not romance and adventure, but the hunger need has urged him on his vast adventures, whether a bankrupt gentleman sailing to colonize Virginia, or a lean Cantonese contracting to labor on the sugar plantations of Hawaii, in each case, gentleman and coolie, it is a desperate attempt to get something to eat, to get more to eat than he can get at home. It has always been so from the time of the first pre-human anthropoid crossing a mountain divide in quest of better berry bushes beyond, down to the latest Slovak, arriving on our shores today to go to work in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. These migratory movements of peoples have been called drifts, and the word is apposite. Unplanned, blind, automatic, spurred on by the pain of hunger, man has literally drifted his way around the planet. There have been drifts in the past, innumerable and forgotten, and so remote that no records have been left, or composed of such low-typed humans or prehumans that they made no scratchings on stone or bone, and left no monuments to show that they had been. These early drifts, we conjecture and know, must have occurred, just as we know that the first upright walking brutes were descended from some kin of quadrumana, through having developed a pair of great toes out of two opposable thumbs. Dominated by fear, and by their very fear accelerating their development, these early ancestors of ours, suffering hunger pangs very like the ones we experience today, drifted on, hunting and being hunted, eating and being eaten, wandering through thousand-year-long odysseys of screaming primordial savagery, until they left their skeletons in glacial gravels, some of them in their bone scratchings in cavemen's lairs. There have been drifts from east to west, and west to east, from north to south and back again, drifts that have criss-crossed one another, and drifts colliding and recoiling and caroming off in new directions. From Central Europe, the Aryans have drifted into Asia, and from Central Asia, the Turanians have drifted across Europe. Asia has thrown forth great waves of hungry humans from the prehistoric round-barrow broadheads who overran Europe and penetrated to Scandinavia and England, down through the hordes of Attila and Tamerlane, to the present immigration of Chinese and Japanese that threatens America. The Phoenicians and the Greeks, with unremembered drifts behind them, colonized the Mediterranean. Rome was engulfed in the torrent of Germanic tribes drifting down from the north before a flood of drifting Asiatics. The Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, after having drifted whence no man knows, poured into Britain, and the English have carried this drift on round the world. Retreating before stronger breeds, hungry and voracious, the Eskimo has drifted to the inhospitable polar regions the pygmy to the fever-rotten jungles of Africa. And in this day the drift of the races continues, whether it be of Chinese into the Philippines and the Malay Peninsula, of Europeans to the United States, or of Americans to the wheatlands of Manitoba and the Northwest. Perhaps most amazing has been the South Sea drift, blind, fortuitous, precarious as no other drift has been. Nevertheless, the islands in that waste of ocean have received drift after drift of the races, down from the mainland of Asia poured an Aryan drift that built civilizations in Ceylon, Java, and Sumatra. Only the monuments of these Aryans remain. They themselves have perished utterly, though not until after leaving evidences of their drift clear across the great South Pacific to Far Easter Island. And on that drift they encountered races who had accomplished the drift before them, and they, the Aryans, passed in turn before the drift of other and subsequent races, whom we today call the Polynesian and the Melanesian. Man early discovered death. As soon as his evolution permitted, he made himself better devices for killing than the old natural ones of fang and claw. He devoted himself to the invention of killing devices, 
before he discovered fire or manufactured for himself religion. And to this day his finest creative energy and technical skill are devoted to the same old task of making better, and even better, killing weapons. All his days, down all the past, have been spent in killing, and from the fear-stricken, jungle-lurking, cave-haunting creature of long ago, he won to empery over the whole animal world, because he developed into the most terrible and awful killer of all the animals. He found himself crowded. He killed to make room, and as he made room, ever he increased and found himself order to plant himself. And sword in hand, he has literally hewn his way through the vast masses of life that occupied the earth space he coveted for himself. And ever he has carried the battle wider and wider, until today not only is he a far more capable killer of men and animals than ever before, but he has pressed the battle home to the infinite and invisible hosts of menacing lives in the world of microorganisms. It is true that they that rose by the sword perished by the sword, and yet not only did they not all perish, but more rose by the sword than perished by it, else man would not today be overrunning the world in such huge swarms. Also it must not be forgotten that they who did not rise by the sword did not rise at all. They were not. In view of this there is something wrong with Dr. Jordan's war theory, which is to the effect that the best being sent out to war, only the second best, the men who are left, remain to breed a second best race, and that therefore the human race deteriorates under war. If this be so, if we have sent forth the best we bred and gone on breeding from the men who were left, and since we have done this for ten thousand millenniums and are what we splendidly are today, then what unthinkably splendid and godlike beings must have been our forebears those ten thousand millenniums ago? Unfortunately for Dr. Jordan's theory, those ancient forebears cannot live up to this fine reputation. We know them for what they were, and before the monkey cage of any menagerie, we catch truer glimpses and hints and resemblances of what our ancestors really were long and long ago. And by killing, incessant killing, by making a shambles of the planet, those ape-like creatures have developed even into you and me. As Henley has said in The Song of the Sword, The sword singing, driving the darkness, even as the banners and spear of the morning, sifting the nations, the slag from the metal, the waste and the weak, from the fit and the strong, fighting the brute, the abysmal fecundity, checking the gross multitudinous blunders, the groping, the purblind excesses and service of the womb universal, the absolute drudge. As time passed and man increased, he drifted ever farther afield in search of room. He encountered other drifts of men, and the killing of men became prodigious. The weak and the decadent fell under the sword, nations that faltered, that waxed prosperous in fat valleys and rich river deltas, were swept away by the drifts of stronger men who were nourished on the hardships of deserts and mountains, and who were more capable with the sword. Unknown and unnumbered billions of men have been so destroyed in prehistoric times. Draper says that in the twenty years of the Gothic War, Italy lost fifteen million of her population, and that the wars, famines, and pestilences of the reign of Justinian diminished the human species by the almost incredible number of one hundred million. Germany, in the Thirty Years' War, lost six million inhabitants. The record of our own American Civil War need scarcely be recalled. And man has been destroyed in other ways than by the sword. Flood, famine, pestilence, and murder are potent factors in reducing population, in making room. As Mr. Charles Woodruff, in his Expansion of Races, has instanced, in 1886, when the dikes of the Yellow River burst, seven million people were drowned. The failure of crops in Ireland in 1848 caused one million deaths. The famines in India of 1896 and 97 in 1899 to 1900, lessened the population by 21 million. The Taiping Rebellion and the Mohammedan Rebellion, combined with the famine of 1877-78, destroyed scores of millions of Chinese. Europe has been swept repeatedly by great plagues. In India, for the period of 1903 to 1907, the plague deaths averaged between one and two millions a year. Mr. Woodruff is responsible for the assertion that 10 million persons now living in the United States are doomed to die of tuberculosis, and in this same country 10,000 persons a year are directly murdered. In China, 
between three and six millions of infants, are annually destroyed, while the total infanticide record of the whole world is appalling. In Africa, now, human beings are dying by millions of the sleeping sickness. More destructive of life than war is industry. In all civilized countries, great masses of people are crowded into slums and labor ghettos, where disease festers, vice corrodes, and famine is chronic, and where they die more swiftly and in greater numbers than do the soldiers in our modern wars. The very infant mortality of a slum parish in the east end of London is three times that of a middle-class parish in the west end. In the United States, in the last 14 years, a total of coal miners greater than our entire standing army has been killed and injured. The United States Bureau of Labor states that during the year 1908, there were between 30,000 and 35,000 deaths of workers by accidents, while 200,000 more were injured. In fact, the safest place for a working man is in the army. And even if that army be at the front, fighting in Cuba or South Africa, the soldier in the ranks has a better chance for life than the working man at home. And yet, despite this terrible role of death, despite the enormous killing of the past and the enormous killing of the present, there are today alive on the planet a billion and three quarters of human beings. Our immediate conclusion is that man is exceedingly fecund and very tough. Never before have there been so many people in the world. In the past centuries, the world's population has been smaller. In the future centuries, it is destined to be larger. And this brings us to that old bugbear that has been so frequently laughed away, and that still persists in raising its grisly head, namely the doctrine of Malthus. While man's increasing efficiency of food production, combined with colonization of whole virgin continents, has for generations given the apparent lie to Malthus's mathematical statement of the law of population, nevertheless the essential significance of his doctrine remains and cannot be challenged. Population does press against subsistence, and no matter how rapidly subsistence increases, population is certain to catch up with it. When man was in the hunting stage of development, wide areas were necessary for the maintenance of scant populations. With the shepherd stages, the means of subsistence being increased, a larger population was supported on the same territory. The agricultural stage gave support to a still larger population, and today, with the increased food-getting efficiency of a machine civilization, an even larger population is made possible. Nor is this theoretical. The population is here, a billion and three-quarters of men, women, and children, and this vast population is increasing on itself by leaps and bounds. A heavy European drift to the New World has gone on and is going on, yet Europe, whose population a century ago was 170 million, has today 500 million, at this rate of increase, provided that subsistence is not overtaken, a century from now the population of Europe will be 1.5 billion. And be it noted, of the present rate of increase in the United States, that only one-third is due to immigration, while two-thirds is due to excess of births over deaths. And at this present rate of increase, the population of the United States will be 500 million in less than a century from now. Man, the hungry one, the killer, has always suffered for lack of room. The world has been chronically overcrowded. Belgium, with her 572 persons to the square mile, is no more crowded than was Denmark when it supported only 500 Paleolithic people. According to Mr. Woodruff, cultivated land will produce 1,600 times as much food as hunting land. From the time of the Norman conquest, for centuries Europe could support no more than 25 to the square mile. Today Europe supports 81 to the square mile. The explanation of this is that for the several centuries after the Norman conquest, her population was saturated. Then, with the development of trading and capitalism, of exploration and exploitation of new lands, and with the invention of labor-saving machinery, and the discovery and application of scientific principles, was brought about a tremendous increase in Europe's food-getting efficiency, and immediately her population sprang up. According to the census of Ireland of 1659, that country had a population of 500,000. 150 years later, her population was 8 million. For many centuries, the population of Japan was stationary. There seemed no way of increasing her food-getting efficiency. Then 60 years ago came Commodore Perry, knocking down her doors and letting in the knowledge and machinery of the superior food-getting efficiency of the Western world. Immediately upon this rise in subsistence began the rise of population, 
and it is only the other day that Japan, finding her population once again pressing against subsistence, embarked sword in hand on a westward drift in search of more room, and sword in hand, killing and being killed, she has carved out for herself Formosa and Korea, and driven the vanguard of her drift far into the rich interior of Manchuria. For an immense period of time China's population has remained at 400 million, the saturation point. The only reason that the Yellow River periodically drowns millions of Chinese is that there is no other land for those millions to farm. And after every such catastrophe, the wave of human life rolls up, and now millions flood out upon that precarious territory. They are driven to it because they are pressed remorselessly against subsistence. It is inevitable that China, sooner or later, like Japan, will learn and put into application our own superior food-getting efficiency. And when that time comes, it is likewise inevitable that her population will increase by unguessed millions until it again reaches the saturation point. And then, inoculated with Western ideas, may she not, like Japan, take sword in hand and start forth colossally on a drift of her own for more room? This is another reputed bogey, the yellow peril. Yet the men of China are only men, like any other race of men, and all men, down all history, have drifted hungrily here, there, and everywhere over the planet, seeking for something to eat. What other men do may not the Chinese do. But a change has long been coming in the affairs of man. The more recent drifts of the stronger races, carving their way through the lesser breeds to more earth space, has led to peace, ever to wider and more lasting peace. The lesser breeds, under penalty of being killed, have been compelled to lay down their weapons and cease killing among themselves. The scalp-talking Indian, and the head-hunting Melanesian have been either destroyed or converted to a belief in the superior efficacy of civil suits and criminal prosecutions. The planet is being subdued. The wild and the hurtful are either tamed or eliminated. From the beasts of prey and the cannibal humans down to the death-dealing microbes, no quarter is given, and daily wider and wider areas of hostile territory, whether of a warring desert tribe in Africa or a pestilential fever hole like Panama, are made peaceable and habitable for mankind. As for the great mass of stay-at-home folk, what percentage of the present generation in the United States, England, or Germany has seen war or knows anything of war at first hand? There was never so much peace in the world as there is today. War itself, the old red anarch, is passing. It is safer to be a soldier than a working man. The chance for life is greater in an active campaign than in a factory or a coal mine. In the matter of killing, war is growing impotent. And this in face of the fact that the machinery of war was never so expensive in the past nor so dreadful. War equipment today in time of peace is more expensive than of old in time of war. A standing army costs more to maintain than it used to cost to conquer an empire. It is more expensive to be ready to kill than it used to be to do the killing. The price of a dreadnought would furnish the whole army of Xerxes with killing weapons, and in spite of its magnificent equipment, war no longer kills as it used to when its methods were simpler. A bombardment by a modern fleet has been known to result in the killing of one mule. The casualties of a twentieth-century war between two world powers are such as to make a worker in an iron foundry turn green with envy. War has become a joke. Men have made for themselves monsters of battle which they cannot face in battle. Subsistence is generous these days, life is not cheap, and it is not in the nature of flesh and blood to indulge in the carnage made possible by present-day machinery. This is not theoretical, as will be shown by a comparison of deaths in battle and men involved in the South African War and the Spanish-American War on the one hand, and the Civil War or the Napoleonic Wars on the other. Not only has war by its own evolution rendered itself futile, but man himself with greater wisdom and higher ethics, is opposed to war. He has learned too much. War is repugnant to his common sense. He conceives it to be wrong, to be absurd, and to be very expensive. For the damage wrought and the results accomplished, it is not worth the price. Just as in the disputes of individuals the arbitration of a civil court instead of a blood feud is more practical, so, man decides, is arbitration more practical in the disputes of nations. War is passing, disease is being conquered, and man's food-getting efficiency is increasing. It is because of these factors that there are a billion and three-quarters of people alive today instead of a billion, or three-quarters of a billion, 
and it is because of these factors that the world's population will very soon be two billions, and climbing rapidly toward three billions. The lifetime of the generation is increasing steadily. Men live longer these days. Life is not so precarious. The newborn infant has a greater chance for survival than at any time in the past. Surgery and sanitation reduce the fatalities that accompany the mischances of life and the ravages of disease. Men and women, with deficiencies and weaknesses that in the past would have affected their rapid extinction, live today in father and mother, a numerous progeny. And high as the food-getting efficiency may soar, population is bound to soar after it. The abysmal fecundity of life has not altered. Given the food, and life will increase. A small percentage of the billion and three quarters that live today may hush the clamor of life to be born, but it is only a small percentage. In this particular, the life in the man-animal is very like the life in the other animals. And still another change is coming in human affairs. Though politicians gnash their teeth and cry anathema, and man whose superficial book-learning is vitiated by crystallized prejudice, assures us that civilization will go to smash, the trend of society today, the world over, is toward socialism. The old individualism is passing. The state interferes more and more in affairs that hitherto have been considered sacredly private, and socialism, when the last word is said, is merely a new economic and political system, whereby more men can get food to eat. In short, socialism is an improved food-getting efficiency. Furthermore, not only will socialism get food more easily and in greater quantity, but it will achieve a more equitable distribution of that food. Socialism promises for a time to give all men, women, and children all they want to eat, and to enable them to eat all they want as often as they want. Subsistence will be pushed back, temporarily, an exceedingly long way. In consequence, the flood of life will rise like a tidal wave. There will be more marriages and more children born. The enforced sterility that obtains today for many millions will no longer obtain, nor will the fecund millions in the slums and labor ghettos, who today die of all the ills due to chronic underfeeding and overcrowding, and who die with their fecundity largely unrealized, die in that future day when the increased food-getting efficiency of socialism will give them all they want to eat. It is undeniable that population will increase prodigiously, just as it has increased prodigiously during the last few centuries following upon the increase in food-getting efficiency. The magnitude of population in that future day is well-nigh unthinkable. But there is only so much land and water on the surface of the earth. Man, despite his marvelous accomplishments, will never be able to increase the diameter of the planet. The old days of virgin continents will be gone. The habitable planet, from ice cap to ice cap, will be inhabited. And in the matter of food-getting, as in everything else, man is only finite. Undreamed-of efficiencies and food-getting may be achieved, but, soon or late, man will find himself face to face with Malthus's grim law. Not only will population catch up with subsistence, but it will press against subsistence, and the pressure will be pitiless and savage. Somewhere in the future is a date when man will face, consciously, the bitter fact that there is not food enough for all of him to eat. When this day comes, what then? Will there be a recrudescence of old, obsolete war? In a saturated population, life is always cheap, as it is cheap in China and India today. Will new human drifts take place, questing for room, carving earth space out of crowded life? Will the sword again sing? Follow, oh, follow then, heroes, my harvesters, where the tall grain is ripe. Thrust in your sickles, stripped and adust, in a stubble of empire, scything and binding, the full sheaves of sovereignty. Even if, as of old, man should wander hungrily, sword in hand, slaying and being slain, the relief would be only temporary. Even if one race alone should hew down the last survivor of all the other races, that one race, drifting the world around, would saturate the planet with its own life and again press against subsistence. And in that day the death rate and the birth rate will have to balance. Men will have to die or be prevented from being born. Undoubtedly, a higher quality of life will obtain, and also a slowly decreasing fecundity. But this decrease will be so slow that the pressure against subsistence will remain. The control of progeny will be one of the most important problems of man, and one of the most important functions of the state. 
men will simply be not permitted to be born. Disease from time to time will ease the pressure. Diseases are parasites, and it must not be forgotten that just as there are drifts in the world of man, so are there drifts in the world of microorganisms, hunger quests for food. Little is known of the microorganic world, but that little is appalling, and no census of it will ever be taken. For there is the true, literal, abysmal fecundity. Multitudinous as man is, all his totality of individuals is as nothing in comparison with the inconceivable vastness of numbers of the microorganisms. In your body or in mine right now are swarming more individual entities than there are human beings in the world today. It is to us an invisible world. We only guess its nearest confines. With our powerful microscopes and ultra-microscopes, enlarging diameters 20,000 times, we catch but the slightest glimpses of that profundity of infinitesimal life. Little is known of that world, save in a general way. We know that out of it arises diseases, new to us, that afflict and destroy man. We do not know whether these diseases are merely the drifts, in a fresh direction, of already existing breeds of microorganisms, or whether they are new, absolutely new breeds themselves, just spontaneously generated. The latter hypothesis is tenable, for we theorize that if spontaneous generation still occurs on the earth, it is far more likely to occur in the form of simple organisms than of complicated organisms. Another thing we know, and that is that it is in crowded populations that new diseases arise. They have done so in the past. They do so today. And no matter how wise are our physicians and bacteriologists, no matter how successfully they cope with these invaders, new invaders continue to arise, new drifts of hungry life seeking to devour us. And so we are justified in believing that in the saturated populations of the future, when life is suffocating in the pressure against subsistence, that new and ever new hosts of destroying microorganisms will continue to arise and fling themselves upon earth-crowded man to give him room. There may be even plagues of unprecedented ferocity that will depopulate great areas before the wit of man can overcome them. And this we know, that no matter how often these invisible hosts may be overcome by man's becoming immune to them through a cruel and terrible selection, new hosts will ever arise of these microorganisms that were in the world before he came and that will be here after he is gone. After he is gone? Will he then some day be gone, and this planet know him no more? Is it thither that the human drift in all its totality is trending? God himself is silent on this point, though some of his prophets have given us vivid representations of that last day when the earth shall pass into nothingness. Nor does science, despite its radium speculations and its attempted analyses of the ultimate nature of matter, give us any other word than that man will pass. So far as man's knowledge goes, law is universal. Elements react under certain unchangeable conditions. One of these conditions is temperature. Whether it be in the test tube of the laboratory or the workshop of nature, all organic chemical reactions take place only within a restricted range of heat. Man, the latest of the ephemera, is pitifully a creature of temperature, strutting his brief day on the thermometer. Behind him is a past wherein it was too warm for him to exist. Ahead of him is a future wherein it will be too cold for him to exist. He cannot adjust himself to that future, because he cannot alter universal law, because he cannot alter his own construction, nor the molecules that compose him. It would be well to ponder these lines of Herbert Spencer's which follow, and which embody, possibly, the wildest vision the scientific mind has ever achieved. Motion as well as matter being fixed in quantity, it would seem that the change in the distribution of matter which motion affects, coming to a limit in whichever direction it is carried, the indestructible motion thereupon necessitates a reverse distribution. Apparently, the universally coexistent forces of attraction and repulsion, which, as we have seen, necessitate rhythm in all minor changes throughout the universe, also necessitate rhythm in the totality of its changes produce now an immeasurable period during which the attractive forces predominating cause universal concentration, and then an immeasurable period during which the repulsive forces predominating cause universal diffusion. Alternate eras of evolution and dissolution. And thus there is suggested the conception of a past 
during which there have been successive evolutions analogous to that which is now going on, a future during which successive other evolutions may go on, ever the same in principle, but never the same in concrete result. That is it, the most we know, alternate eras of evolution and dissolution. In the past there have been other evolutions, similar to that one in which we live, and in the future there may be other similar evolutions. That is all. The principle of all these evolutions remains, but the concrete results are never twice alike. Man was not, he was, and again he will not be. In eternity which is beyond our comprehension, the particular evolution of that solar satellite we call the Earth occupied but a slight fraction of time, and of that fraction of time man occupies but a small portion. All the whole human drift, from the first ape-man to the last savant, is but a phantom, a flash of light, and a flutter of movement across the infinite face of the starry night. When the thermometer drops, man ceases, with all his lusts and wrestlings and achievements, with all his race adventures and race tragedies, and with all his red killings, billions upon billions of human lives multiplied by as many billions more. This is the last word of science, unless there be some further unguessed word which science will some day find and utter. In the meantime, it sees no farther than the starry void, where the fleeting systems lapse like foam. Of what ledger account is the tiny life of man, in a vastness where stars snuff out like candles, and great suns blaze for a time tick of eternity, and are gone. And for us who live, no worse can happen than has happened to the earliest drifts of man, marked today by ruined cities of forgotten civilization. Ruined cities which on excavation are found to rest on ruins of earlier cities. City upon city, and fourteen cities down to a stratum where still earlier wandering herdsmen drove their flocks, and where, even preceding them, wild hunters chased their prey long after the caveman and the man of the squatting place cracked the knuckle-bones of wild animals and vanished from the earth. There is nothing terrible about it. With Richard Hovey, when he faced his death, we can say, Behold, I have lived. And with another and greater one we can lay ourselves down with a will. The one drop of living, the one taste of being, has been good. And perhaps our greatest achievement will that we dreamed immortality, even though we failed to realize it. End of section one. The Human Drift. Section two of The Human Drift by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Small Boat Sailing A sailor is born, not made, and by sailor is meant not the average, efficient, and hopeless creature who is found today in the foxhole of deep-water ships, but the man who will take a fabric compounded of wood and iron and rope and canvas and compel it to obey his will on the surface of the sea. Barring captains and mates of big ships, the small boat sailor is the real sailor. He knows, he must know, how to make the wind carry his craft from one given point to another given point. He must know about tides and rips and eddies, bar and channel markings, and day and night signals. He must be wise in weather lore, and he must be sympathetically familiar with the peculiar qualities of his boat, which differentiated from every other boat that was ever built and rigged. He must know how to gentle her about, as one instance of a myriad, and to fill her on the other tack without deadening her way or allowing her to fall off too far. The deep-water sailor of today needs know none of these things, and he doesn't. He pulls and hauls as he is ordered, swabbed sticks, washes paint, and chips iron rust. He knows nothing and cares less. Put him in a small boat and he is helpless. He will cut an even better figure on the hurricane deck of a horse. I shall never forget my child astonishment when I first encountered one of these strange beings. He was a runaway English sailor. I was a lad of twelve with a decked-over fourteen-foot centerboard skiff which I had taught myself to sail. I sat at his feet, as at the feet of a god, while he discoursed of strange lands and peoples, deeds of violence and hair-raising gales at sea. Then one day I took him for a sail. 
with all the trepidation of the veriest little amateur, I hoisted sail and got under way. Here was a man, looking on critically, I was sure, who knew more in one second about boats and the water than I could ever know. After an interval, in which I exceeded myself, he took the tiller and the sheet. I sat on the little thwart amidships, open-mouthed, prepared to learn what real sailing was. My mouth remained open, for I learned what a real sailor was in a small boat. He couldn't trim the sheet to save himself. He nearly capsized several times in squalls, and once again, by blunderingly jibing over, he didn't know what a centerboard was for, nor did he know that in running a boat before the wind one must sit in the middle instead of on the side. And finally, when we came back to the wharf, he ran the skiff in full tilt, shattering her nose and carrying away the mast step. And yet he was a really truly sailor, fresh from the vasty deep. Which points my moral. A man can sail in the foxholes of big ships all his life and never know what real sailing is. From the time I was twelve, I listened to the lure of the sea. When I was fifteen, I was captain and owner of an oyster pirate sloop. By the time I was sixteen, I was sailing in scow schooners, fishing salmon with the Greeks up the Sacramento River, and serving as sailor on the fish patrol. And I was a good sailor, too, though all my cruising had been on San Francisco Bay and the rivers tributary to it. I'd never been on the ocean in my life. Then the month I was seventeen I signed before the mast as an able seaman on a three-top-mast schooner bound on seven months' cruise across the Pacific and back again. As my shipmates promptly informed me, I had had my nerve with me to sign on as able seaman. Yet, behold, I was an able seaman. I had graduated from the right school. It took no more than minutes to learn the names and uses of the few new ropes. It was simple. I did not do things blindly. As a small boat sailor, I had learned to reason out and know the why of everything. It is true I had to learn how to steer by a compass, which took maybe half a minute. But when it came to steering full and by, and close and by, I could beat the average of my shipmates, because that was the very way I had always sailed. Inside fifteen minutes I could box the compass around and back again. And there was little else to learn during that seven months' cruise, except fancy rope sailorizing, such as the more complicated lanyard knots, and the making of various kinds of sennet and rope mats, the point of all which is that it is by means of small boat sailing that the real sailor is best schooled. And if a man is a born sailor, and has gone to the school of the sea, never in all his life can he get away from the sea again. The salt of it is in his bones as well as his nostrils, and the sea will call to him until he dies. Of late years I have found easier ways of earning a living. I have quit the foxhole for keeps, but always I come back to the sea. In my case it is usually San Francisco Bay, then which is no lustier, tougher sheet of water can be found for small boat sailing. It really blows on San Francisco Bay. During the winter, which is the best cruising season, we have southeasters, southwesters, and occasional howling northers. Throughout the summer we have what we call the sea breeze, an unfailing wind off the Pacific that on most afternoons in the week blows what the Atlantic coast yachtsmen would name a gale. They are always surprised by the small spread of canvas our yachts carry. Some of them, with schooners they have sailed around the horn, have looked proudly at their own lofty sticks and huge spreads, then patronizingly, and even pityingly at ours. Then, perchance, they have joined in a club cruise from San Francisco to Mare Island. They found the morning run up the bay delightful. In the afternoon, when the brave west wind ramped across San Pablo Bay and they faced it on the long beat home, things were somewhat different. One by one, like a flight of swallows, our more meagerly sparred and canvassed yachts went by, leaving them wallowing and dead and shortening down in what they called a gale, but which we called a dandy sailing breeze. The next time they came out we would notice their sticks cut down, their booms shortened, and their after leeches nearer the luffs by whole cloths. As for excitement, there is all the difference in the world between a ship in trouble at sea and a small boat in trouble on landlocked water. Yet for genuine excitement and thrill give me the small boat. Things happen so quickly, and there are always so few to do the work, and hard work too, as the small boat sailor knows. I have toiled all night, both watches on deck, in a typhoon off the coast of Japan, and been less exhausted than by two hours' work at reefing down a thirty-foot sloop and heaving up two anchors on a lee shore in a screaming southeaster. Hard work and excitement? 
let the wind baffle and drop in a heavy tideway, just as you are sailing your little sloop through a narrow drawbridge. Behold your sails, upon which you are depending, flap with sudden emptiness, and then see the impish wind, with a haul of eight points, fill your jib aback with a gusty puff. Around she goes and sweeps, not through the open draw, but broadside on against the solid piles. Hear the roar of the tide, sucking through the trestle, and hear and see your pretty fresh-painted boat crash against the piles. Feel her stout little hull give to the impact. See the rail actually pinch in. Hear your canvas tearing, and see the black, square-ended timbers thrusting holes through it. Smash! There goes your topmast stay, and the topmast reels over drunkenly above you. There is a ripping and crunching. If it continues, your starboard shrouds will be torn out. Grab a rope, any rope, and take a turn around a pile. But the free end of the rope is too short. You can't make it fast, and you hold on and wildly yell for your one companion to get a turn with another and longer rope. Hold on! You hold on till you are purple in the face, till it seems your arms are dragging out of their sockets, till the blood bursts from the ends of your fingers. But you hold, and your partner gets the longer rope and makes it fast. You straighten up and look at your hands. They are ruined. You can scarcely relax the crooks of the fingers. The pain is sickening, but there is no time. The skiff, which is always perverse, is pounding against the barnacles on the piles, which threaten to scrape its gunwale off. It's drop the peak, down jib. Then you run lines and pull and haul and heave and exchange unpleasant remarks with the bright tender who is always willing to meet you more than halfway in such repartee. And finally, at the end of an hour, with aching back, sweat-soaked shirt, and slaughtered hands, you are through and swinging along on the placid, beneficent tide between narrow banks, where the cattle stand knee-deep and gaze wonderingly at you. Excitement! Work! Can you beat it in a calm day on the deep sea? I've tried it both ways. I remember laboring in a fourteen days gale off the coast of New Zealand. We were a tramp collier, rusty and battered with six thousand tons of coal in our hold. Lifelines were stretched fore and aft, and on our weather side attached to smokestack guys and rigging were huge rope nettings hung there for the purpose of breaking the force of the seas and so saving our mess-room doors. But the doors were smashed, and the mess-rooms washed out just the same. And yet, out of it all, arose but the one feeling, namely, of monotony. In contrast with the foregoing, about the liveliest eight days of my life were spent in a small boat on the west coast of Korea. Never mind why I was thus voyaging up the Yellow Sea during the month of February in below zero weather. The point is that I was in an open boat, a sampan, on a rocky coast where there were no lighthouses, and where the tides ran from thirty to sixty feet. My crew were Japanese fishermen. We did not speak each other's language. Yet there was nothing monotonous about that trip. Never shall I forget one particular cold, bitter dawn when, in the thick of driving snow, we took in sail and dropped our small anchor. The wind was howling out of the northwest, and we were on a lee shore. Ahead and astern, all escape was cut off by rocky headlands, against whose bases burst the unbroken seas. To windward a short distance, seen only between the snow squalls, was a low rocky reef. It was this that inadequately protected us from the whole yellow sea that thundered in upon us. The Japanese crawled under a communal rice mat and went to sleep. I joined them, and for several hours we dozed fitfully. Then a sea deluged us out with icy water, and we found several inches of snow on the top mat. The reef to windward was disappearing under the rising tide, and moment by moment the seas broke more strongly over the rocks. The fishermen studied the shore anxiously. So did I. And with a sailor's eye, though I could see little chance for a swimmer to gain that surf-hammered line of rocks. I made signs toward the headlands on either flank. The Japanese shook their heads. I indicated that dreadful lee shore. Still, they shook their heads and did nothing. My conclusion was that they were paralyzed by the hopelessness of the situation. Yet, our extremity increased with every minute, for the rising tide was robbing us of the reef that served as buffer. It soon became a case of swamping at our anchor. Seas were splashing on board in growing volume, and we bailed constantly, and still my fisherman crew eyed the surf-battered shore and did nothing. At last, after many narrow escapes from complete swamping, the fishermen got into action— all hands tailed on to the anchor and hove it up. Forward, as the boat head paid off, we set a patch of sail about the size of a flour sack, and we headed straight for shore. I unlaced my shoes, unbuttoned my greatcoat and coat, and was ready to make a quick partial strip a minute or so before we struck. But we didn't strike, 
and, as we rushed in, I saw the beauty of the situation. Before us opened a narrow channel, frilled at its mouth with breaking seas. Yet long before, when I had scanned the shore closely, there had been no such channel. I had forgotten the thirty-foot tide, and it was for this tide that the Japanese had so precariously waited. We ran the frill of breakers, curved into a tiny sheltered bay where the water was scarcely flawed by the gale, and landed on a beach where the salt sea of the last tide lay frozen in long curving lines. And this was one gale of three in the course of those eight days in the sampan. Would it have been beaten on a ship? I fear me the ship would have gone aground on the outlying reef, and that its people would have been incontinently and monotonously drowned. There are enough surprises and mishaps in a three days cruise in a small boat to supply a great ship on the ocean for a full year. I remember once taking out on her trial trip a little thirty-footer I had just bought. In six days we had two stiff blows, and in addition one proper southwester and one rip-snorting southeaster. The slight intervals between these blows were dead calms. Also, in the six days, we were aground three times. Then, too, we tied up the bank in the Sacramento River, and grounding by an accident on the steep slope on a falling tide, nearly turned a side somersault down the bank. In a stark calm and heavy tide in the Carquinez Straits, where anchors skate on the channel's scoured bottom, we were sucked against a big dock and smashed and bumped down a quarter of a mile of its length before we could get clear. Two hours afterward, on San Pablo Bay, the wind was piping up and we were reefing down. It is no fun to pick up a skiff adrift in a heavy sea and gale. That was our next task, for our skiff, swamping, parted both towing painters we had bent on. Before we recovered it, we had nearly killed ourselves with exhaustion, and we certainly had strained the sloop in every part from Kilson to truck. And to cap it all, coming into our home port, beating up the narrowest part of the San Antonio estuary, we had a shave of inches from collision with a big ship in tow of a tug. I have sailed the ocean in far larger craft a year at a time, in which period occurred no such chapter of moving incident. After all, the mishaps are almost the best part of small boat sailing. Looking back, they prove to be punctuations of joy. At the time, they try your metal and your vocabulary, and may make you so pessimistic as to believe that God has a grudge against you. But afterward, ah, afterward, with what pleasure you remember them, and with what gusto do you relate them to your brother skippers in the fellowhood of small boat sailing? A narrow winding slough, a half-tide, exposing mud surfaced with gangrenous slime, the water itself filthy and discolored by the waste from the vats of a nearby tannery. The marsh grass on either side, mottled with all the shades of a decaying orchid, a crazy ramshackled ancient wharf, and at the end of the wharf, a small, white-painted sloop, nothing romantic about it, no hint of adventure, a splendid pictorial argument against the alleged joys of small boat sailing. Possibly that is what Cloudsley and I thought, that somber, leaden morning as we turned out to cook breakfast and wash decks. The latter was my stunt, but one look at the dirty water overside and another at my fresh-painted deck deterred me. After breakfast we started a game of chess. The tide continued to fall, and we felt the sloop begin to list. We played on until the chessmen began to fall over. The list increased, and we went on deck. Bowline and stern line were drawn taut. As we looked, the boat listed still farther with an abrupt jerk. The lines were now very taut. As soon as her belly touches the bottom, she will stop, I said. Cloudsley sounded with a boat hook along the outside. Seven feet of water, he announced. The bank is almost up and down. The first thing that touches will be her mast when she turns bottom up. An ominous, minute, snapping noise came from the stern line. Even as we looked, we saw a strand fray in part. Then we jumped. Scarcely had we bent another line between the stern and the wharf when the original line parted. As we bent another line forward, the original one there crackled and parted. After that, it was an inferno of work and excitement. We ran more and more lines, and more and more lines continued to part, and more and more the pretty boat went over on her side. We bent all our spare lines, we unrove sheets and halyards, we used our two-inch hawser, we fastened lines part way up the mast, halfway up, and everywhere else. We toiled and sweated, and announced our mutual and sincere conviction that God's grudge still held against us. Country yokels came down on the wharf and sniggered at us, when Cloudsley let a coil of rope slip down the inclined deck into the vile slime and fished it out with seasick countenance, the yokels sniggered louder, 
and it was all I could do to prevent him from climbing up on the wharf and committing murder. By the time the sloop's deck was perpendicular, we had unbent the boom lift from below, made it fast to the wharf, and, with the other end fast nearly to the masthead, heaved it taut with block and tackle. The lift was of steel wire. We were confident that it could stand the strain, but we doubted the holding power of the stays that held the mast. The tide had two more hours to ebb, and it was the big run-out, which meant that five hours must elapse ere the returning tide would give us a chance to learn whether or not the sloop would rise to it and right herself. The bank was almost up and down, and at the bottom directly beneath us, the fast ebbing tide left a pit in the vilest, illest-smelling, illest-appearing muck to be seen in many a day's ride, said Cloudsley to me gazing down into it. I love you as a brother. I'd fight for you. I'd face roaring lions and sudden death by field and flood. But just the same, don't you fall into that. He shuddered nauseously. For if you do, I haven't the grit to pull you out. I simply couldn't. You'd be awful. The best I could do would be to take a boat hook and shove you down out of sight. We sat on the upper sidewall of the cabin, dangled our legs down the top of the cabin, leaned our backs against the deck, and played chess until the rising tide and the block and tackle on the boom lift enabled us to get her on a respectable keel again. Years afterward, down in the South Seas on the island of Isabel, I was caught in a similar predicament. In order to clean her copper, I had careened the snark broadside onto the beach and outward. When the tide rose, she refused to rise. The water crept in through the scuppers mounted over the rail, and the level of the ocean slowly crawled up the slant of the deck. We battened down the engine-room hatch, and the sea rose to it and over it and climbed perilously near to the cabin companionway and skylight. We were all sick with fever, but we turned out in the blazing tropic sun and toiled madly for several hours. We carried our heaviest lines ashore from our mastheads and heaved with our heaviest purchase until everything crackled, including ourselves. We would spell off and lie down like dead men, then get up and heave and crackle again, and in the end our lower rail five feet under water and the wavelets lapping the companionway combing the sturdy little craft shivered and shook herself and pointed her masts once more to the zenith. There is never lack of exercise in small boat sailing, and the hard work is not only part of the fun of it, but it beats the doctors. San Francisco Bay is no mill pond. It is a large and drafty and variegated piece of water. I remember one winter evening trying to enter the mouth of the Sacramento. There was a freshet on the river. The flood tide from the bay had been beaten back into a strong ebb, and the lusty west wind died down with the sun. It was just sunset, and with a fair to middling breeze, dead aft, we stood still in the rapid current. We were squarely in the mouth of the river, but there was no anchorage, and we drifted backward, faster and faster, and dropped anchor outside as the last breath of wind left us. The night came on, beautiful and warm and starry. My one companion cooked supper, while on deck I put everything in shape, Bristol fashion. When we turned in at nine o'clock, the weather promise was excellent. If I'd carried a barometer, I'd have known better. By two in the morning, our shrouds were thrumming in a piping breeze, and I got up and gave her more scope on her hawser. Inside another hour, there was no doubt that we were in for a southeaster. It is not nice to leave a warm bed and get out of a bad anchorage in a black, blowy night, but we arose to the occasion, put in two reefs, and started to heave up. The winch was old, and the strain of the jumping head sea was too much for it. With the winch out of commission, it was impossible to heave up by hand. We knew because we tried it and slaughtered our hands. Now a sailor hates to lose an anchor. It is a matter of pride. Of course, we could have buoyed ours and slipped it. Instead, however, I gave her still more hawser, veered her, and dropped the second acre. There was little sleep after that, for first one and then the other of us would be rolling out of our bunks. The increasing size of the seas told us we were dragging, and when we struck the scoured channel we could tell by the feel of it that our two anchors were fairly skating across. It was a deep channel, the farther edge of it rising steeply like the wall of a canyon, and when our anchors started up that wall they hid in and held. Yet when we fetched up through the darkness we could hear the seas breaking on the solid shore astern, and so near was it that we shortened the skiff's painter. Daylight showed us that between the stern of the skiff and destruction was no more than a score of feet. And how it did blow! There were times in the gusts when the wind must have approached a velocity of seventy or eighty miles an hour. But the anchors held, 
and so nobly that our final anxiety was that the forward bits would be jerked clean out of the boat. All day the sloop alternately ducked her nose under and sat down on her stern, and it was not till late afternoon that the storm broke in one last and worst mad gust. For a full five minutes an absolute dead calm prevailed, and then, with the suddenness of a thunderclap, the wind snorted out of the southwest, a shift of eight points and a boisterous gale. Another night of it was too much for us, and we hove up by hand in a crosshead sea. It was not stiff work, it was heartbreaking, and I know we were both near to crying from the hurt and the exhaustion. And when we did get the first anchor up and down, we couldn't break it out. Between seas we snubbed her nose down to it, took plenty of turns, and stood clear as she jumped. Almost everything smashed and parted except the anchor hold. The chocks were jerked out, the rail torn off, and the very covering board splintered, and still the anchor held. At last, hoisting the reefed mainsail and slacking off a few of the hard-won feet of the chain, we sailed the anchor out. It was nip and tuck, though, and there were times when the boat was knocked down flat. We repeated the maneuver with the remaining anchor, and in the gathering darkness fled into the shelter of the river's mouth. I was born so long ago that I grew up before the era of gasoline. As a result, I am old-fashioned. I prefer a sailboat to a motorboat, and it is my belief that boat sailing is a finer, more difficult, and sturdier art than running a motor. Gasoline engines are becoming foolproof, and while it is unfair to say that any fool can run an engine, it is fair to say that almost anyone can. Not so when it comes to sailing a boat. More skill, more intelligence, and a vast deal more training are necessary. It is the finest training in the world for boy and youth and man. If the boy is very small, equip him with a small, comfortable skiff. He will do the rest. He won't need to be taught. Shortly he will be setting a tiny leg of mutton and steering with an oar. Then he will begin to talk keels and centerboards and want to take his blankets out and stop aboard all night. But don't be afraid for him. He is bound to run risks and encounter accidents. Remember, there are accidents in the nursery as well as out on the water. More boys have died from hothouse culture than have died on boats large and small, and more boys have been made into strong and reliant men by boat sailing than by lawn croquet and dancing school. And once a sailor, always a sailor. The savor of the salt never stales. The sailor never grows so old that he does not care to go back for one more wrestling bout with wind and wave. I know of it myself. I have turned rancher, and live beyond sight of the sea. Yet I can stay away from it only so long. After several months have passed, I begin to grow restless. I find myself daydreaming over incidents of the last cruise, or wondering if the striped bass are running on Wingo Slough, or eagerly reading the newspapers for reports of the first northern flights of ducks. And then suddenly there is a hurried pack of suitcases and overhauling of gear, and we are off for Vallejo where the little roamer lies, waiting, always waiting for the skiff to come alongside, for the lighting of the fire in the galley stove, for the pulling off of gaskets, the swinging up of the mainsail, and the rat-tat-tat of the reef points, for the heaving short and the breaking out, and for the twirling of the wheel as she fills away and heads up bay or down. Jack London, on board Roamer, Sonoma Creek, April fifteenth, 1911. End of section two, small boat sailing. Section three of The Human Drift by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Four Horses and a Sailor. Huh, drive four horses. I wouldn't sit behind you, not for a thousand dollars over them mountain roads. So said Henry, and he ought to have known, for he drives four horses himself said another Glen Ellen friend. What? London? He drive four horses? Can't drive one. And the best of it is that he was right. Even after managing to get a few hundred miles with my four horses, I don't know how to drive one. Just the other day, swinging down a steep mountain road and rounding an abrupt turn, I came full tilt on a horse and buggy, being driven by a woman up the hill. We could not pass on the narrow road where it was only a foot to spare, and my horses did not know how to back, especially uphill. About two hundred yards down the hill was a spot where we could pass. The driver of the buggy said she didn't dare back down because she was not sure of the brake, and as I didn't know how to tackle one horse, I didn't try it. So we unhitched her horse and backed down by hand, which was very well till it came to hitching the horse to the buggy again. She didn't know how, I didn't either, and I depended on her knowledge, 
It took us about half an hour with frequent debates and consultations, though it is an absolute certainty that never in its life was that horse hitched in that particular way. No, I can't harness up one horse, but I can four, which compels me to back up again to get to my beginning. Having selected Sonoma Valley for our abiding place, Charmian and I decided it was about time we knew what we had in our own county and the neighboring ones. How to do it was the first question. Among our many weaknesses is the one of being old-fashioned. We don't mix with gasoline very well, and as true sailors should, we naturally gravitate toward horses. Being one of those lucky individuals who carries his office under his hat, I should have to take a typewriter and a load of books along. This puts saddle horses out of the running. Charmian suggested driving a span. She had faith in me. Besides, she could drive a span herself. But when I thought of the many mountains to cross, and of crossing them for three months with a poor, tired span, I vetoed the proposition, and said we'd have to come back to gasoline after all. This she vetoed just as emphatically, and a deadlock obtained until I received inspiration. "'Why not drive four horses?' I said. "'But you don't know how to drive four horses,' was her objection. I threw my chest out and my shoulders back. "'What man has done, I can do,' I proclaimed grandly. "'And please don't forget that when we sailed on the snark I knew nothing of navigation, and that I taught myself as I sailed.' "'Very well,' she said. "'And there's faith for you. "'They shall be four saddle-horses, and we'll strap our saddles on behind the rig.' It was my turn to object. Our saddle-horses are not broken to harness. Then break them. And what I knew about horses, much less about breaking them, was just about as much as any sailor knows. Having been kicked, bucked off, fallen over backward, and thrown out and run over on very numerous occasions, I had a mighty vigorous respect for horses. But a wife's faith must be lived up to, and I went at it. King was a polo pony from St. Louis, and Prince a many-gated love horse from Pasadena. The hardest thing was to get them to dig in and pull. They rollicked along on the levels and galloped down the hills, but when they struck an upgrade and felt the weight of the breaking cart, they stopped and turned around and looked at me. But I passed them, and my troubles began. Milda was fourteen years old, an unadulterated broncho, and in temperament was a combination of mule and jackrabbit blended equally. If you pressed your hand on her flank and told her to get over, she lay down on you. If you got her by the head and told her to back, she walked forward over you. And if you got behind her and shoved and told her to giddy up, she sat down on you. Also, she wouldn't walk. For endless weary miles I strove with her, but never could I get her to walk a step. Finally, she was a manger glutton. No matter how near or far from the stable, when six o'clock came around, she bolted for home and never missed the directest crossroad. Many times I rejected her. The fourth and most rejected horse of all was the outlaw. From age of three to seven, she had defied all horse-breakers and broke a number of them. Then a long, lanky cowboy with a fifty-pound saddle and a Mexican bit had got her proud goat. I was the next owner. She was my favorite riding horse. Charmian said I'd have to put her in as a wheeler where I would have more control over her. Now, Charmian had a favorite riding mare called Maid. I suggested Maid as a substitute. Charmian pointed out that my mare was a branded range horse, while hers was a near thoroughbred, and that the legs of her mare would be ruined forever if she were driven for three months. I acknowledged her mare's thoroughbredness, and at the same time defied her to find any thoroughbred with as small and delicately viciously pointed ears as my outlaw. She indicated Maid's exquisitely thin shinbone. I measured the outlaw's. It was equally thin, although I insinuated possibly more durable. This stabbed Charmian's pride. Of course, her near thoroughbred maid, carrying the blood of old Lexington, Morella, and a streak of the super-enduring Morgan, could run, walk, and work my unregistered outlaw into the ground. And that was the very precise reason why such a paragon of a saddle animal should not be degraded by harness. So it was that Charmian remained obdurate, until one day I got her behind the outlaw for a forty-mile drive. For every inch of those forty miles, the outlaw kicked and jumped in between the kicks and jumps, finding time and space in which to seize its teammate by the back of the neck and attempt to drag it to the ground. Another trick the outlaw developed during that drive was suddenly to turn at right angles in the traces and endeavor to butt its teammate over the grade. Reluctantly and nobly did Charmian give in and consent to the use of maid. 
The outlaw's shoes were pulled off, and she was turned out on range. Finally, the four horses were hooked to the rig, a light Studebaker trap. With two hours and a half of practice, in which the excitement was not abated by several jack poles and numerous kicking matches, I announced myself as ready for the start. Came the morning, and Prince, who was to have been a wheeler with maid, showed up with a badly kicked shoulder. He did not exactly show up. We had to find him, for he was unable to walk. His legs swelled and continually swelled during the several days we waited for him. Remained only the outlaw. In from pasture she came. Shoes were nailed on, and she was harnessed into the wheel. Friends and relatives strove to press accident policies on me, but Charmian climbed up alongside, and Nakata got into the rear seat with the typewriter. Nakata, who sailed cabin boy on the snark for two years, and who had shown himself afraid of nothing, not even of me and my immature jamborees and experimenting with new modes of locomotion. And we did very nicely, thank you, especially after the first hour or so, during which time the outlaw had kicked about fifty various times, chiefly to the damage of her own legs and the paintwork, and after she had bitten a couple of hundred times, to the damage of Maid's neck and Charmian's temper. It was hard enough to have her favorite mare in the harness, without also enduring the spectacle of its being eaten alive. Our leaders were joys, King being a polo pony, and Milda a rabbit. They rounded curves beautifully and darted ahead like coyotes out of the way of the wheelers. Milda's besetting weakness was a frantic desire not to have the lead bar strike her hocks. When this happened, one of three things occurred. Either she sat down on the lead bar, kicked it up in the air until she got her back under it, or exploded in a straight-ahead harness-disrupting jump. Not until she carried the lead bar clean away and danced a breakdown on it in the traces did she behave decently. Nakata and I made the repairs with good old-fashioned bell rope, which is stronger than wrought iron any time, and we went on our way. In the meantime, I was learning. I shall not say to tool a foreign hand, but just simply to drive four horses. Now it is all right enough to begin with four work horses pulling a load of several tons, but to begin with four light horses, all running, and a light rig that seemed to outrun them, well, when things happen, they happen quickly. My weakness was total ignorance. In particular, my fingers lacked training, and I made the mistake of depending on my eyes to handle the reins. This brought me against a disastrous optical illusion. The bite of the off-headline, being longer and heavier than that of the off-wheel line, hung lower. In a moment requiring quick action, I invariably mistook the two lines. Pulling on what I thought was the wheel line, in order to straighten the team, I would see the leaders swing abruptly around into a jackpole. Now for sensations of sheer impotence, nothing can compare with a jackpole. When the horrified driver beholds his leaders prancing gaily up the road, and his wheelers jogging steadily down the road, all at the same time, and all harnessed together into the same rig. I no longer jackpole, and I don't mind admitting how I got out of the habit. It was my eyes that enslaved my fingers into ill practices, so I shut my eyes and let the fingers go it alone. Today my fingers are independent of my eyes and work automatically. I do not see what my fingers do. They just do it. All I see is the satisfactory result. Still, we managed to get over the ground that first day, down sunny Sonoma Valley to the old town of Sonoma, founded by General Vallejo as the remotest outpost on the northern frontier for the purpose of holding back the Gentiles, as the wild Indians of those days were called. Here history was made. Here the last Spanish mission was reared. Here the bare flag was raised. And here Kit Carson and Fremont and all our early adventurers came and rested in the days before the days of gold. We swung on over the low rolling hills, through miles of dairy farms and chicken ranches, where every blessed hen is white, and down the slopes to Pentaluma Valley. Here in 1776, Captain Quiros came up Petaluma Creek from San Pablo Bay in quest of an outlet to Bodega Bay on the coast. And here, later, the Russians, with Alaskan hunters, carried skin boats across from Fort Ross to poach for sea otters on the Spanish preserve of San Francisco Bay. Here, too, still later, General Vallejo built a fort, which still stands, one of the finest examples of Spanish abode that remained to us. And here, at the old fort, to bring the chronicle up to date, our horses proceeded to make peculiarly personal history with astonishing success and dispatch. King, our peerless polo pony leader, went lame. So hopelessly lame did he go that no expert, then and afterward, 
could determine whether the lameness was in his frogs, hoofs, legs, shoulders, or head. Maid picked up a nail and began to limp. Milda, figuring the day already sufficiently spent and maniacal with manger gluttony, began to rabbit jump. All that held her was the bail rope, and the outlaw, game to the last, exceeded all previous exhibitions of skin-removing, paint-marring, and horse-eating. At Petaluma we rested over while King was returned to the ranch and Prince sent to us. Now Prince had proved himself an excellent wheeler, yet he had to go into the lead and let the outlaw retain his old place. There is an axiom that a good wheeler is a poor leader. I object to the last adjective. A good wheeler makes an infinitely worse kind of leader than that. I know. Now. I ought to know. Since that day I have driven Prince a few hundred miles in the lead. He is neither any better nor any worse than the first mile he ran in the lead, and is worse as even extremely worse than what you are thinking. Not that he is vicious, he is merely a good-natured rogue who shakes hands for sugar, steps on your toes out of sheer excessive friendliness, and just goes on loving you in your harshest moments. But he won't get out of the way. Also, whenever he is reproved for being in the wrong, he accuses Milda of it, and bites the back of her neck. So bad has this become that whenever I yell Prince in a loud voice, Milda immediately rabbit jumps to the side straight ahead, or sits down on the lead bar, all of which is quite disconcerting. Picture it yourself. You are swinging round a sharp downgrade mountain curve at a fast trot. The rock wall is the outside of the curve. The inside of the curve is a precipice. The continuance of the curve is a narrow, unrailed bridge. You hit the curve, throwing the leaders in against the wall and making the polo horse do the work. All is lovely. The leaders are hugging the wall like nestling doves. But the moment comes in the evolution when the leaders must shoot out ahead. They really must shoot, or else they'll hit the wall and miss the bridge. Also, behind them are the wheelers and the rig, and you have just eased the brake in in order to put sufficient snap into the maneuver. If ever teamwork is required, now is the time. Milda tries to shoot. She does her best, but Prince, bubbling over with roguishness, lags behind. He knows the trick. Milda is half a length ahead of him. He times it to the fraction of a second. Maid, in the wheel, overrunning him, naturally bites him. This disturbs the outlaw, who has been behaving beautifully, and... She immediately reaches across for Maid. Simultaneously, with a fine display of firm conviction that it's all Milda's fault, Prince sinks his teeth into the back of Milda's defenseless neck. The whole thing has occurred in less than a second. Under the surprise and pain of the bite, Milda either jumps ahead to the imminent peril of harness and lead bar, or smashes into the wall, stops short with the lead bar over her back, and emits a couple of hysterical kicks. The outlaw invariably selects this moment to remove paint, and after things are untangled and you have had time to appreciate the close shave, you go up to Prince and reprove him with your choicest vocabulary. And Prince, gazelle-eyed and tender, offers to shake hands with you for sugar. I'll leave it to anyone. A boat would never act that way. We have some history north of the bay. Nearly three centuries and a half ago, that doughty pirate and explorer Sir Francis Drake, combing the Pacific for Spanish galleons, anchored in the bight formed by Point Reyes, on which today is one of the richest dairy regions in the world. Here, less than two decades after Drake, Sebastian and Carmenon piled up on the rocks with a silk-laden galleon from the Philippines. And in the same bay of Drake, long afterward, the Russian fur poachers rendezvoused their bedarkas and stole in through the Golden Gate to the forbidden waters of San Francisco Bay. Farther up the coast, in Sonoma County, we pilgrimaged to the sites of the Russian settlements. At Bodega Bay, south of what today is called Russian River, was their anchorage, while north of the river they built their fort. And much of Fort Ross still stands. Log bastions, church, and stables hold their own, and so well, with rusty hinges creaking, that we warmed ourselves at the hundred years old double fireplace, and slept under the hand-hewn roof beams, still held together by spikes of hand-wrought iron. We went to see where history had been made, and we saw scenery as well. One of our stretches in a day's drive was from beautiful Inverness on Tamales Bay, down the Olima Valley to Balinas Bay, across the eastern shore of that body of water to Willow Camp, and up over the sea bluffs, around the bastions of Tamalpais, and down to Sausalito, from the head of Bolinas Bay to Willow Camp, the drive on the edge of the beach, and actually for half-mile stretches in the waters of the bay itself was a delightful experience. The wonderful part was to come. Very few San Franciscans, much less Californians, know of that drive from Willow Camp, 
to the south and east along the poppy-blown cliffs, with the sea thundering in the sheer depths, hundreds of feet below and the Golden Gate opening up ahead, disclosing smoky San Francisco on her many hills. Far off, blurred on the breast of the sea, can be seen the Farallones, which Sir Francis Drake passed on a southwest course in the thick of what he describes as a stinking fog. Well, might he call it that, and a few other names, for it was the fog that robbed him of the glory of discovering San Francisco Bay. It was on this part of the drive that I decided at last I was learning real mountain driving. To confess the truth, for delicious titillation of one's nerve, I have since driven over no mountain road that was worse or better, rather, than that piece. And then the contrast, from Sausalito, over excellent park-like boulevards, through the splendid redwoods and homes of Mill Valley across the blossomed hills of Marin County, along the knoll-studded picturesque marshes, past San Rafael resting warmly among her hills, over the divide and up the Petaluma Valley, and on the grassy feet of Sonoma Mountain and home. We covered fifty-five miles that day. Not so bad, eh, for Prince the Rogue, the paint-removing outlaw, the thin-shanked thoroughbred, and the rabbit jumper. And they came in cool and dry, ready for their mangers and the straw. Oh, we didn't stop. We considered we were just starting, and that was many weeks ago. We have kept on going over six counties, which are comfortably large, even for California, and we are still going. We have twisted and tabled, criss-crossed our tracks, made fascinating and lengthy dives into the interior valleys and the hearts of Napa and Lake counties, traveled the coast for hundreds of miles on end, and are now in Eureka on Humboldt Bay, which was discovered by accident by the gold seekers, who were trying to find their way to and from the Trinity diggings. Even here, the white man's history preceded them. For dim tradition says that the Russians once anchored here and hunted sea otter before the first Yankee trader rounded the horn, or the first Rocky Mountain trapper thirsted across the great American desert and trickled down the snowy Sierras to the sun-kissed land. No, we are not resting our horses here on Humboldt Bay. We are writing this article, gorging on abalones and mussels, digging clams and catching record-breaking sea trout and rock cod in the intervals in which we are not sailing, motor-boating, and swimming in the most temperately equable climate we have ever experienced. These comfortably large counties, they are veritable empires. Take Humboldt, for instance. It is three times as large as Rhode Island, one and a half times as large as Delaware, almost as large as Connecticut, and half as large as Massachusetts. The pioneer has done his work in this north of the Bay region. The foundations are laid, and all is ready for the inevitable inrush of population and adequate development of resources, which so far have been no more than skimmed, and casually and carelessly skimmed at that. This region of the six counties alone will some day support a population of millions. In the meanwhile, oh, you home-seekers, you wealth-seekers, and above all, you climate-seekers, now is the time to get in on the ground floor. Robert Ingersoll once said that the genial climate of California would, in a fairly brief time, evolve a race resembling the Mexicans, and that in two or three generations the Californians would be seen of a Sunday morning on their way to a cockfight, with a rooster under each arm. Never was made a rasher generalization based on so absolute an ignorance of facts. It is to laugh. Here is a climate that breeds vigor with just sufficiently geniality to prevent the expenditure of most of that vigor in fighting the elements. Here is a climate where a man can work 365 days in the year without the slightest hint of innervation, and where for 365 nights he must perforce sleep under blankets. What more can one say? I consider myself somewhat of climate expert, having adventured among most of the climates of five out of six zones. I've not yet been in the Antarctic, but whatever climate obtains, there will not deter me from drawing the conclusion that nowhere is there a climate to compare with that of this region. Maybe I am as wrong as Ingersoll was. Nevertheless, I take my medicine by continuing to live in this climate. Also, it is the only medicine I ever take. But to return to the horses. There is some improvement. Milda has actually learned to walk. Maid has proved her thoroughbredness by never tiring on the longest days, and while being the strongest and highest spirited of all, never causing any trouble save for an occasional kick at the outlaw. And the outlaw rarely gallops, no longer butts, only periodically kicks, comes into the pole, and does her work without attempting to vivisect Maid's medulla oblongata. And Marvel of Marvels is really and truly getting lazy. But Prince remains the same incorrigible, loving, and lovable rogue he has always been. And the country we've been over, the drives through Napa and Lake Counties. 
one from Sonoma Valley via Santa Rosa, we could not refrain from taking several days, and on all the ways we found the roads excellent for machines as well as horses. One route, and a more delightful one for an automobile cannot be found, is out from Santa Rosa past Old Altruria and Mark West Springs, then to the right and across to Calistoga and Napa Valley. By keeping to the left, the drive holds on up the Russian River Valley, through the miles of the noted Asti Vineyards to Cloverdale, and then by way of Pieta, Witter, and Highland Springs to Lakeport. Still another way we took was down Sonoma Valley, skirting San Pablo Bay and up the lovely Napa Valley. From Napa were side excursions through Pope and Berryessa Valleys and on to Etna Springs and still on into Lake County, crossing the famous Langtree Ranch. Continuing up the Napa Valley, walled on either hand by great rock palisades and redwood forests and carpeted with endless vineyards, and crossing the many stone bridges for which the county is noted and which are a joy to the beauty-loving eyes as well as to the four-horse Tiro driver, past Calistoga with its old mud baths and chicken soup springs, with St. Helena and its giant saddle ever towering before us. We climbed the mountains on a good grade and dropped down past the quicksilver mines to the canyon of the geysers. After a stop overnight and an exploration of the miniature grand volcanic scene, we pulled on across the canyon and took the grade where the cicadas simmered audibly in the noon sunshine among the hillside manzanitas. Then higher came the big cattle-dotted upland pastures and the rocky summit. And here on the summit abruptly we caught a vision, or what seemed a mirage, the ocean we had left long days before. Yet far down and away shimmered a blue sea framed on the farther shore by rugged mountains, on the near shore by fat and rolling farmlands. Clear Lake was before us, and like proper sailors, we returned to our sea, going for a sail, a fish, and a swim, ere the day was done and turning into tired Lakeport blankets in the early evening. Well has Lake County been called the Walden County, but the railroad is coming. They say the approach we made to Clear Lake is similar to the approach to Lake Lucerne. Be that as it may, the scenery, with its distant snow-capped peaks, can well be called Alpine, and what can be more exquisite than the drive out from Clear Lake to Ukiah by way of the Blue Lake's chain, every turn bringing into view a picture of breathless beauty, every glance backward revealing some perfect composition in line and color, the intense blue of the water margined with splendid oaks, green fields, and swaths of orange poppies. But those side glances and backward glances were provocative of trouble. Charmian and I disagreed as to which way the connecting stream of water ran. We still disagree, for at the hotel where we submitted the affair to arbitration, the hotel manager and the clerk likewise disagreed. I assume now that we will never know which way that stream runs. Charmian suggests both ways. I refuse such a compromise. No stream of water I ever saw could accomplish that feat at one and the same time. The greatest concession I can make is that sometimes it may run one way and sometimes the other, and that in the meantime we should both consult an oculist. More valley from Ukiah to Willits, and then we turn westward through the virgin Sherwood forest of magnificent redwood, stopping at Alpine for the night, and continuing on through Mendocino County to Fort Bragg and Saltwater. We also came to Fort Bragg up the coast from Fort Ross, keeping our coast journey intact from the Golden Gate. The coast weather was cool and delightful, the coast driving superb, Especially in the Fort Ross section did we find the roads thrilling, while all the way along we followed the sea. At every stream the road skirted dizzy cliff edges, dived down into lush growths of forest and ferns, and climbed out along the cliff edges again. The way was lined with flowers, wild lilac, wild roses, poppies, and lupins. Such lupins! Giant clumps of them, of every lupin shade and color. And it was along the Mendocino roads that Charmian caused many delays by insisting on getting out to pick the wild blackberries, strawberries, and thimbleberries, which grew so profusely. And ever we caught peeps far down of steam schooners loading lumber in the rocky coves, ever we skirted the cliffs, day after day crossing stretches of rolling farmlands, and passing through thriving villages and sawmill towns. Memorable was our launch trip from Mendocino City up Big River, where the steering gears of the launches work the reverse of anywhere else in the world, where we saw a stream of logs of six to twelve and fifteen feet in diameter, which filled the riverbed for miles to the obliteration of any sign of water, and where we were told of a white or albino redwood tree. We did not see this last, so cannot vouch for it. All the streams were filled with trout, and more than once we saw the side-hill salmon on the slopes. 
No, side-hill salmon is not a peripatetic fish. It is a deer out of season. But the trout. At Gualala, Charmian caught her first one. Once before in my life, I had caught two, on angleworms. On occasion, I had tried fly and spinner and never got a strike, and I had come to believe that all this talk of fly fishing was just so much nature faking. But on the Gualala River, I caught trout, a lot of them, on fly and spinners, and I was beginning to feel quite an expert, until Nakata, fishing on bottom with a pellet of bread for bait, caught the biggest trout of all. I now affirm there is nothing in science nor in art. Nevertheless, since the day poles and baskets have been added to our baggage, we tackle every stream we come to, and we no longer are able to remember the grand total of our catch. At Usal, many hilly and picturesque miles north of Fort Bragg, we turned again into the interior of Mendocino, crossing the ranges and coming out in Humboldt County on the south fork of Eel River at Garberville. Throughout the trip from Marin County north, we had been warned of bad roads ahead, yet we never found those bad roads. We seemed always to be just ahead of them, or behind them. The farther we came, the better the road seemed, though this was probably due to the fact that we were learning more and more what four horses and a light rig could do on a road. And thus do I save my face with all the counties. I refuse to make invidious road comparisons. I can add that while, save in rare instances on steep pitches, I have trotted my horses down all the grades, I have never had one horse fall down, nor have I had to send the rig to a blacksmith shop for repairs. Also, I'm learning to throw leather. If any tyro thinks it easy to take a short-handled, long-lashed whip and throw the end of that lash just where he wants it, let him put on automobile goggles and try it. On reconsideration, I would suggest the substitution of a wire fencing mask for the goggles. For days I looked at that whip. It fascinated me, and the fascination was composed mostly of fear. At my first attempt, Charmian and Nakata became afflicted with the same sort of fascination, and for a long time afterward, whenever they saw me reach for the whip, they closed their eyes and shielded their heads with their arms. Here's the problem. Instead of pulling honestly, Prince is lagging behind and maneuvering for a bite at Milda's neck. I have four reins in my hands. I must put these four reins into my left hand, properly gather the whip handle and the bite of the lash in my right hand, and throw that lash past Maid without striking her and into Prince. If the lash strikes Maid, her thoroughbredness will go up in the air, and I'll have a case of horse hysteria on my hands for the next half hour. But, follow, the whole problem is not yet started. Suppose that I miss Maid and reach the intended target. The instant the lash cracks, the four horses jump, Prince most of all, and his jump, with spread wicked teeth, is for the back of Milda's neck. She jumps to escape which is her second jump for the first one came when the lash exploded. The outlaw reaches for Maid's neck, and Maid, who has already jumped and tried to bolt, tries to bolt harder. And all this infinitesimal fraction of time, I am trying to hold the four animals with my foot, and on the rebound, catch that flying lash in the hollow of my right arm and get the bite of it safely into my right hand. Then I must get two of the four lines back into my right hand and keep the horses from running away or going over the grade. Try it sometime. You will find life anything but wearisome. Why, the first time I hit the mark and made the lash go off like a revolver shot, I was so astounded and delighted that I was paralyzed. I forgot to do any of the multitudinous other things, tangled the whiplash in maid's harness, and was forced to call upon Charmian for assistance. And now, confession. I carry a few pebbles handy. They're great for reaching prints in a tight place. But just the same, I'm learning that whip every day. And before I get home, I hope to discard the pebbles. And as long as I rely on pebbles, I cannot truthfully speak of myself as tooling a foreign hand. From Garberville, where we ate eel to repletion and got acquainted with the aborigines, we drove down the Eel River Valley for two days, through the most unthinkably glorious body of redwood timber to be seen anywhere in California. From Dyerville on to Eureka, we caught glimpses of railroad construction and of great concrete bridges in the course of building, which advertised that at least Humboldt County was going to be linked to the rest of the world. We still consider our trip is just begun. As soon as this is mailed from Eureka, it's hi-ho for the horses and pull on. We shall continue up the coast, turn in for Hoopa Reservation and the gold mines, and shoot down the Trinity and Klamath Rivers and Indian canoes to Requa. After that, we shall go on through Del Norte County and into Oregon. The trip so far has justified us in taking the attitude that we won't go home until the winter rains drive us in.
And finally, I am going to try the experiment of putting the outlaw in the lead, and relegating Prince to his old position in the rear wheel. I won't need any pebbles then. End of section 3. Four Horses and a Sailor. Section 4 of The Human Drift by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Nothing that ever came to anything. It was at Quito, the mountain capital of Ecuador, that the following passage at correspondence took place. Having occasion to buy a pair of shoes in a shop six feet by eight in size, with walls three feet thick, I noticed a mangy leopard skin on the floor. I had no Spanish. The shopkeeper had no English, but I was an adept at sign language. I wanted to know where I should go to buy leopard skins. On my scribble pad I drew the interesting streets of a city. Then I drew a small shop, which, after much effort, I persuaded the proprietor into recognizing as his shop. Next I indicated in my drawing that on the many streets there were many shops. And finally I made myself into a living interrogation mark, pointing all the while from the mangy leopard skin to the many shops I had sketched. But the proprietor failed to follow me. So did his assistant. The street came in to help, that is, as many as could crowd into the six-by-eight shop. While those that could not force their way in held an overflow meeting on the sidewalk, the proprietor and the rest took turns at talking to me in rapid-fire Spanish, and, from the expressions on their faces, all concluded that I was remarkably stupid. Again I went through my program, pointing on the sketch from the one shop to the many shops, pointing out that in this particular shop was one leopard skin, and then questing interrogatively with my pencil among all the shops. All regarded me in blank silence, until I saw comprehension suddenly dawn on the face of a small boy. "'Tigres Montaña!' he cried. This appealed to me as mountain tigers, namely leopards, and in token that he understood the boy made signs for me to follow him, which I obeyed. He led me for a quarter of a mile, and paused before the doorway of a large building where soldiers slouched on sentry duty, and in and out of which went other soldiers. Motioning for me to remain, he ran inside. Fifteen minutes later he was out again, without leopard skins, but full of information. By means of my card, of my hotel card, of my watch, and of the boy's fingers, I learned the following that at six o'clock that evening he would arrive at my hotel with ten leopard skins for my inspection. Further, I learned that the skins were the property of one Captain Ernesto Bacucci. Also, I learned that the boy's name was Elisio. The boy was prompt. At six o'clock he was at my room. In his hand was a small roll addressed to me. On opening it I found it to be a manuscript piano music, the Hora Tranquila Valse, or Tranquil Hour Waltz, by Ernesto Bacucci. I came for leopard skins, thought I, and the owner sends me sheet music instead. But the boy assured me that he would have the skins at the hotel at nine next morning, and I entrusted to him the following letter of acknowledgment. Dear Captain Bacucci, a thousand thanks for your kind presentation of Hora Tranquila Valse. Mrs. London will play it for me this evening. Sincerely yours, Jack London. Next morning, Alicio was back, but without the skins. Instead, he gave me a letter written in Spanish, of which the following is a free translation. To my dearest and always appreciated friend, I submit myself. Dear sir, I sent you last night an offering by the bearer of this note, and you returned me a letter which I translated. Be it known to you, sir, that I am giving this waltz away in the best society, and therefore to your honored self. Therefore, it is beholden to you to recognize the attention. I mean by a tangible return, as this composition was made by myself. You will therefore send by your humble servant, the bearer, any offering, however minute, that you may be prompted to make. Send it under cover of an envelope. The bearer may be trusted. I did not indulge in the pleasure of visiting your honorable self this morning, as I find my body not to be enjoying the normal exercise of its functions. As regards the skins from the mountain, you shall be waited on by a small boy at seven o'clock at night, with ten skins from which you may select those which most satisfy your aspirations. In the hope that you will look upon this in the same light as myself, I beg to be allowed to remain your most faithful servant, Captain Ernesto Bacucci. Well, thought I, this Captain Ernesto Bacucci has shown himself to be such an undependable person that, while I don't mind rewarding him for his composition, I fear me if I do, I never shall lay eyes on those leopard skins. 
So to Alicio I gave this letter for the captain. My dear Captain Bacucci, have the boy bring the skins at seven o'clock this evening when I shall be glad to look at them. This evening when the boy brings the skins I shall be pleased to give him in an envelope for you a tangible return for your musical composition. Please put the price on each skin and also let me know for what sum all the skins will sell together. Sincerely yours, Jack London. Now, thought I, I have him. No skins, no tangible return. And evidently he is set on receiving that tangible return. At seven o'clock, Elicio was back, but without leopard skins. He handed me this letter. Signor London, I wish to instill in you the belief that I lost today, at half past three in the afternoon, the key to my cubicle. While distributing rations to the soldiers, I dropped it. I see in this loss the act of God. I received a letter from your honorable self, delivered by the one who bears you, this poor response of mine. Tomorrow I will burst open the door, to permit me to keep my word with you. I feel myself eternally shamed not to be able to dominate the evils that afflict colonial mankind. Please send me the trifle that you offered me. Send me this proof of your appreciation by the bearer, who is to be trusted. Also give to him a small sum of money for himself, and earn the undying gratitude of your most faithful servant, Captain Ernesto Bacucci. Also enclosed in the foregoing letter was the following original poem, apropos neither of leopard skins nor tangible returns so far as I can make out. Effusion. Thou canst not weep, nor ask I for a year to rid me of my woes, or make my life more dear. The mystic chains that bound thy all-fond heart to mine, alas, asundered are, for now and for all time. In vain you strove to hide from vulgar gaze of man the burning glance of love that none but love can scan. Go on thy starlit way, and leave me to my fate. Our souls must needs unite, but God, twill be too late. To all and sundry, of which I replied, My dear Captain Bacucci, I regret exceedingly to hear that by act of God, at half-past three this afternoon, you lost the key to your cubicle. Please have the boy bring the skins at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, at which time, when he brings the skins, I shall be glad to make you that tangible return for your tranquil hour waltz. Sincerely yours, Jack London. At seven o'clock came no skins, but the following. Sir, after offering you my most sincere respects, I beg to continue by telling you that no one, up to the time of writing, has treated me with such lack of attention. It was a present to gentlemen, who were to retain the piece of music, and who have all, without exception, made me a present of five dollars. It is beyond my humble capacity to believe that you, after having offered to send me money in an envelope, should fail to do so. Send me, I pray of you, the money to remunerate the small boy for his repeated visits to you. Please be discreet and send it in an envelope by the bearer. Last night I came to the hotel with the boy. You were dining. I waited more than an hour for you and then went to the theater. Give the boy some small amount and send me a like offering of larger proportions awaiting incessantly a slight attention on your part. Captain Ernesto Bacucci. And here, like one of George Moore's realistic studies, ends this intercourse with Captain Ernesto Bacucci. Nothing happened. Nothing ever came to anything. He got no tangible return, and I got no leopard skins. The tangible return he might have got, I presented to Alicio, who promptly invested it in a pair of trousers and a ticket to the bullfight. Note to editor, this is a faithful narration of what actually happened in Quito, Ecuador. End of section 4. Nothing that ever came to anything. Section 5 of The Human Drift by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. That dead men rise up never. The month in which my seventeenth birthday arrived I signed on before the mast on the Sophie Sutherland, a three-topmast schooner, bound on a seven-months seal-hunting cruise to the coast of Japan. We sailed from San Francisco, and immediately I found confronting me a problem of no inconsiderable proportions. There were twelve men of us in the forecastle, ten of whom were hardened, tarry-thumbed sailors. Not alone was I, a youth, and on my first voyage— but I had for shipmates men who had come through the hard school of the merchant service of Europe. As boys, they had had to perform their ship's duty, and, in addition, 
by immemorial sea custom they had had to be the slaves of the ordinary and able-bodied seamen when they had become ordinary seamen they were still the slaves of the able-bodied thus in the forecastle with the watch below an able seaman lying in his bunk will order an ordinary seaman to fetch him his shoes or bring him a drink of water now the ordinary seaman may be lying in his bunk he is just as tired as the able seaman yet he must get out of his bunk and fetch and carry if he refuses he will be beaten if perchance he is so strong that he can whip the able seaman then all the able seamen or as many as may be necessary pitch upon the luckless devil and administer the beating my problem now becomes apparent these hard-bit scandinavian sailors had come through a hard school as boys they had served their mates and as able seamen they looked to be served by other boys i was a boy with all with a man's body i had never been to sea before with all i was a good sailor knew my business it was either a case of holding my own with them or of going under I had signed on as an equal, and an equal I must maintain myself, or else endure seven months of hell at their hands. And it was this very equality they resented. By what right was I an equal? I had not earned that high privilege. I had not endured the miseries they had endured as maltreated boys or bullied ordinaries. Worse than that, I was a landlubber making his first voyage. And yet, by the injustice of fate, on the ship's articles I was their equal. My method was deliberate, and simple, and drastic. In the first place, I resolved to do my work, no matter how hard or dangerous it might be, so well that no man would be called upon to do it for me. Further, I put ginger in my muscles. I never malingered when pulling on a rope, for I knew the eagle eyes of my foxhole mates were squinting for just such evidences of my inferiority. I made it a point to be among the first of the watch going on deck, among the last going below, never leaving a sheet or tackle for someone else to coil over a pin. I was always eager for the run aloft for the shifting of topsail sheets and tacks, or for the setting or taking in of topsails, and in these matters I did more than my share. Furthermore, I was on a hair-trigger of resentment myself. I knew better than to accept any abuse or the slightest patronizing. At the first hint of such I went off. I exploded. I might be beaten in the subsequent fight, but I left the impression that I was a wildcat, and that I would just as willingly fight again. My intention was to demonstrate that I would tolerate no imposition. I proved that the man who imposed on me must have a fight on his hands, and doing my work well, the innate justice of the men, assisted by their wholesome dislike for a clawing and rending wildcat ruction, soon led them to give over their hectoring. After a bit of strife my attitude was accepted, and it was my pride that I was taken in as an equal in spirit as well as in fact. From then on everything was beautiful, and the voyage promised to be a happy one. But there was one other man in the forecastle, counting the Scandinavians as ten, and myself as the eleventh. This man was the twelfth and last. We never knew his name, contenting ourselves with calling him the Bricklayer. He was from Missouri, at least he so informed us in the one meager confidence he was guilty of in the early days of the voyage. Also at that time we learned several other things, he was a bricklayer by trade. He had never even seen salt water until the week before he joined us, at which time he had arrived in San Francisco and looked upon San Francisco Bay. Why he, of all men, at forty years of age, should have felt the prod to go to sea was beyond all of us. For it was our unanimous conviction that no man less fitted for the sea had ever embarked on it. But to sea he had come. After a week's stay in a sailor's boarding-house, he had been shoved aboard of us as an able seaman. All hands had to do his work for him. Not only did he know nothing, but he proved himself unable to learn anything. Try as they would, they could never teach him to steer. To him the compass must have been a profound and awful whirligig. He never mastered its cardinal points, much less the checking and steadying of the ship on her course. He never did come to know whether ropes should be coiled from left to right or from right to left. It was mentally impossible for him to learn the easy muscular trick of throwing his weight on a rope and pulling and hauling. The simplest knots and turns were beyond his comprehension, while he was mortally afraid of going aloft. Bullied by captain and mate, he was one day forced aloft. He managed to get underneath the cross-trees, and there he froze to the ratlines. Two sailors had to go after him to help him down. All of which was bad enough had there been no worse. But he was vicious, malignant, dirty, and without common decency. He was a tall, powerful man, and he fought with everybody, and there was no fairness in his fighting. His first fight on board, the first day out, 
was with me when he, desiring to cut a plug of chewing tobacco, took my personal table knife for the purpose, and whereupon I, on a hair trigger, promptly exploded. After that he fought with nearly every member of the crew. When his clothing became too filthy to be bearable by the rest of us, we put it to soak and stood over him while he washed it. In short, the bricklayer was one of those horrible and monstrous things that one must see in order to be convinced that they exist. I will only say that he was a beast, and that we treated him like a beast. It is only by looking back through the years that I realize how heartless we were to him. He was without sin. He could not, by the very nature of things, have been anything else than he was. He had not made himself, and for his making he was not responsible. Yet we treated him as a free agent, and held him personally responsible for all that he was, and that he should not have been. As a result, our treatment of him was as terrible as he was himself terrible. Finally, we gave him the silent treatment, and for weeks before he died we neither spoke to him, nor did he speak to us. And for weeks he moved among us, or lay in his bunk in our crowded house, grinning at us his hatred and malignancy. He was a dying man, and he knew it, and we knew it. And furthermore, he knew that we wanted him to die. He cumbered our life with his presence, and ours was a rough life that made rough men of us. And so he died, in a small space, crowded by twelve men, and as much alone as if he had died on some desolate mountain peak. No kindly word, no last word, was passed between. He died as he had lived, a beast, and he died hating us, and hated by us. And now I come to the most startling moment of my life. No sooner was he dead than he was flung overboard. He died in a night of wind, drawing his last breath as the men tumbled into their oilskins to the cry of all hands. And he was flung overboard, several hours later, on a day of wind. Not even a canvas wrapping graced his mortal remains, nor was he deemed worthy of bars of iron at his feet. We sewed him up in the blankets in which he died, and laid him on a hatch cover, forward of the main hatch on the port side. A gunny sack, half full of galley coal, was fastened to his feet. It was bitter cold. The weather side of every rope, spar, and stay was coated with ice, while all the rigging was a harp, singing and shouting under the fierce hand of the wind. The schooner, hove to, lurched and floundered through the sea, rolling her scuppers under and perpetually flooding the deck with icy salt water. We of the forecastle stood in sea boots and oilskins. Our hands were mittened, but our heads were bared in the presence of the death we did not respect. Our ears stung and numbed and whitened, and we yearned for the body to be gone. But the interminable reading of the burial service went on. The captain had mistaken his place, and while he read on without purpose we froze our ears and resented this final hardship thrust upon us by the helpless cadaver. As from the beginning, so too the end, everything had gone wrong with the bricklayer. Finally the captain's son, irritated beyond measure, jerked the book from the palsied fingers of the old man and found the place. Again the quavering voice of the captain arose. Then came the cue. And the body shall be cast into the sea. We elevated one end of the hatch cover, and the bricklayer plunged outboard and was gone. Back into the forecastle we cleaned house, washing out the dead man's bunk and removing every vestige of him. By sea law and sea custom, we should have gathered his effects together and turned them over to the captain, who later would have held an auction in which we should have bid for the various articles. But no man wanted them, so we tossed them up on deck and overboard in the wake of the departed body, the last ill treatment we could devise to wreak upon the one we had hated so. Oh, it was raw, believe me, but the life we lived was raw, and we were as raw as the life. The bricklayer's bunk was better than mine. Less sea water leaked down through the deck into it, and the light was better for lying in bed and reading. Partly for this reason I proceeded to move into his bunk. My other reason was pride. I saw the sailors were superstitious, and by this act I determined to show that I was braver than they. I would cap my proved equality by a deed that would compel their recognition of my superiority. Oh, the arrogance of youth! But let that pass. The sailors were appalled by my intention. One and all they warned me that in the history of the sea no man had taken a dead man's bunk and lived to the end of the voyage. They instanced case after case in their personal experience. I was obdurate. Then they begged and pleaded with me, and my pride was tickled in that they showed they really liked me and were concerned about me. This but served to confirm me in my madness. I moved in, and lying in the dead man's bunk all afternoon and evening listened to dire prophecies of my future. 
Also, we're told stories of awful deaths and gruesome ghosts that secretly shivered the hearts of all of us. Saturated with this, yet scoffing at it, I rolled over at the end of the second dog watch and went to sleep. At ten minutes to twelve I was called, and at twelve I was dressed and on deck, relieving the man who had called me. On the ceiling grounds, when hove to, a watch of only a single man is kept through the night, each man holding the deck for an hour. It was a dark night, though not a black one. The gale was breaking up and the clouds were thinning. There should have been a moon, and, though invisible, in some way a dim, suffused radiance came from it. I paced back and forth across the deck amidships. My mind was filled with the event of the day and with the horrible tales my shipmates had told. And yet, I dare to say, here and now, that I was not afraid. I was a healthy animal, and furthermore, intellectually, I agreed with Swinburne that dead men rise up never. The bricklayer was dead, and that was the end of it. He would rise up never, at least never on the deck of the Sophie Sutherland. Even then he was in the ocean depths, miles to windward of our leeward drift, and the likelihood was that he was already portioned out in the maws of many sharks. Still my mind pondered on the tales of the ghosts of dead men I had heard, and I speculated on the spirit world. My conclusion was that if the spirits of the dead still roamed the world, they carried the goodness of the malignancy of the earth life with them. Therefore, granting the hypothesis, which I didn't grant at all, the ghost of the bricklayer was bound to be as hateful and malignant as he in life had been. But there wasn't any bricklayer's ghost. That I insisted upon. A few minutes, thinking thus, I paced up and down. Then, glancing casually forward along the port side, I leaped like a startled deer, and in a blind madness of terror rushed aft along the poop, heading for the cabin. Gone was all my arrogance of youth and my intellectual calm. I had seen a ghost. There, in the dim light where we had flung the dead man overboard, I had seen a faint and wavering form. Six feet in length it was, slender, and of substance so attenuated that I had distinctly seen through it the tracery of the fore-rigging. As for me, I was as panic-stricken as a frightened horse. I, as I, had ceased to exist. Through me were vibrating the fiber instincts of ten thousand generations of superstitious forebears who had been afraid of the dark and the things of the dark. I was not I. I was, in truth, those ten thousand forebears. I was the race, the whole human race, in its superstitious infancy. Not until part way down the cabin companionway did my identity return to me. I checked my flight and clung to the steep ladder, suffocating, trembling, and dizzy. Never before nor since have I had such a shock. I clung to the ladder and considered I could not doubt my senses. That I had seen something there was no discussion. But what was it? Either a ghost or a joke? There could be nothing else. If a ghost, the question was, would it appear again? If it did not, and I aroused the ship's officers, I would make myself the laughing stock of all on board. And by the same token, if it were a joke, my position would be still more ridiculous. If I were to retain my hard-won place of equality, it would never do to arouse anyone until I ascertained the nature of the thing. I am a brave man. I dare to say so, for in fear and trembling I crept up the companionway and went back to the spot from which I had first seen the thing. It had vanished. My bravery was qualified, however. Though I could see nothing, I was afraid to go forward to the spot where I had seen the thing. I resumed my pacing up and down, and though I cast many an anxious glance toward the dread spot, nothing manifested itself. As my equanimity returned to me, I concluded that the whole affair had been a trick of the imagination, and that I had got whatever I deserved for allowing my mind to dwell on such matters. Once more, my glances forward were casual and not anxious. And then suddenly I was a madman rushing wildly aft. I had seen the thing again, the long, wavering, attenuated substance through which could be seen the fore-rigging. This time I had reached only the break of the poop when I checked myself. Again I reasoned over the situation, and it was pride that counseled strongest. I could not afford to make myself a laughing-stock. This thing, whatever it was, I must face alone. I must work it out for myself. I looked back to the spot where we had tilted the bricklayer. It was vacant. Nothing moved, and for a third time I resumed my amidships pacing. In the absence of the thing, my fear died away and my intellectual poise returned. Of course, it was not a ghost. Dead men did not rise up. It was a joke, a cruel joke. My mates of the foxhole, by some unknown means, were frightening me. 
Twice already must they have seen me run aft. My cheeks burned with shame. In fancy I could hear the smothered chuckling and laughter even then going on in the forecastle. I began to grow angry. Jokes were all very well, but this was carrying the thing too far. I was the youngest on board, only a youth, and they had no right to play tricks on me of the order that I well knew in the past had made raving maniacs of men and women. I grew angrier and angrier, and resolved to show them that I was made of sterner stuff, and at the same time to wreak my resentment upon them. If the thing appeared again, I made my mind up that I would go up to it, furthermore that I would go up to it knife in hand. When within striking distance, I would strike. If a man, he would get the knife thrust he deserved. If a ghost, well, it wouldn't hurt the ghost any, while I would have learned that dead men did rise up. Now I was very angry, and I was quite sure the thing was a trick. But when the thing appeared a third time, in the same spot, long, attenuated, and wavering, fear surged up in me and drove most of my anger away. But I did not run, nor did I take my eyes from the thing. Both times before it had vanished while I was running away, so I had not seen the manner of its going. I drew my sheath knife from my belt and began my advance. Step by step, nearer and nearer, the effort to control myself grew more severe. The struggle was between my will, my identity, my very self, on the one hand, and on the other the ten thousand ancestors who were twisting into the fibers of me, and whose ghostly voices were whispering of the dark and the fear of the dark that had been theirs in the time when the world was dark and full of terror. I advanced more slowly, and still the thing wavered and flitted with strange eerie lurches, and then right before my eyes it vanished. I saw it vanish. Neither to the right nor left did it go, nor backward. Right there, while I gazed upon it, it faded away, ceased to be. I didn't die, but I swear from what I had experienced in those few succeeding moments that I know full well that men can die of fright. I stood there, knife in hand, swaying automatically to the roll of the ship, paralyzed with fear. Had the bricklayer suddenly seized my throat with corporeal fingers and proceeded to throttle me, it would have been no more than I expected. Dead men did rise up, and that would be the most likely thing the malignant bricklayer would do. But he didn't seize my throat. Nothing happened. And since nature abhors a status, I could not remain there in the one place forever paralyzed. I turned and started aft. I did not run. What was the use? What chance had I against a malevolent world of ghosts? Flight, with me, was the swiftness of my legs. The pursuit with a ghost was the swiftness of thought and there were ghosts. I had seen one. And so, stumbling slowly aft, I discovered the explanation of the seeming. I saw the mizzen topmast lurching across a faint radiance of cloud behind which was the moon. The idea leaped in my brain. I extended the line between the cloudy radiance and the mizzen topmast and found that it must strike somewhere near the fore rigging on the port side. Even as I did this, the radiance vanished. The driving clouds of the breaking gale were alternately thickening and thinning before the face of the moon, but never exposing the face of the moon. And when the clouds were at their thinnest, it was a very dim radiance that the moon was able to make. I watched and waited. The next time the clouds thinned, I looked forward, and there was the shadow of the topmast, long and attenuated, wavering and lurching on the deck and against the rigging. This was my first ghost. Once again have I seen a ghost. It proved to be a Newfoundland dog, and I don't know which of us was the more frightened, for I hit that Newfoundland a full right arm swing to the jaw. Regarding the bricklayer's ghost, I will say that I never mentioned it to a soul on board. Also, I will say that in all my life I never went through more torment and mental suffering than on that lonely night watch on the Sophie Sutherland. To the editor, this is not a fiction. It is a true page out of my life. End of section 5 that dead men rise up never. Section 6 of The Human Drift by Jack London This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Section 6. A Classic of the Sea Introduction to Two Years Before the Mast Once in a hundred years is a book written that lives not alone for its own century, but which becomes a document for the future centuries. Such a book is Dana's, when Marriott's and Cooper's sea novels are gone to dust, stimulating and joyful as they have been to generations of men, still will remain two years before the mast. 
Paradoxical as it may seem, Dana's book is the classic of the sea, not because there was anything extraordinary about Dana, but for the precise contrary reason that he was just an ordinary, normal man, clear-seeing, hard-headed, controlled, fitted with adequate education to go about the work. He brought a trained mind to put down with untroubled vision what he saw of a certain phase of a workaday life. There was nothing brilliant nor fly-away about him. He was not a genius. His heart never rode his head. He was neither overlorded by sentiment nor hag-ridden by imagination. Otherwise, he might have been guilty of the beautiful exaggerations in Melville's Taipei, or the imaginative orgies in the latter's Moby Dick. It was Dana's cool poise that saved him from being spread-eagled and flogged when two of his mates were so treated. It was his lack of abandon that prevented him from taking up permanently with the sea, that prevented him from seeing more than one poetical spot, and more than one romantic spot on all the coast of old California. Yet these apparent defects were his strength. They enabled him magnificently to write, and for all time, the picture of the sea life of his time. Written close to the middle of the last century, such has been the revolution worked in man's method of trafficking with the sea, that the life and conditions described in Dana's book have passed utterly away. Gone are the crack clippers, the driving captains, the hard-bitten but efficient foremast hands. Remain only crawling cargo tanks, dirty tramps, greyhound liners, and a somber, sordid type of sailing ship. The only records broken today by sailing vessels are those for slowness. They are no longer built for speed, nor are they manned before the mast by as sturdy a sailor stock, nor aft the mast are they officered by sail-carrying captains and driving mates. Speed is left to the liners who run the silk and tea and spices. Admiralty courts, boards of trade and underwriters frown upon driving and sail-carrying. No more are the free and easy daredevil days when fortunes were made in fast runs and lucky ventures not alone for owners, but for captains as well. Nothing is ventured now. The risks of swift passages cannot be abided. Freights are calculated to the least fraction of percent. The captains do no speculating, no bargain-making for the owners. The latter attend to all this, and by wire and cable rake the ports of the seven seas in quest of cargoes, and through their agents make all business arrangements. It has been learned that small crews only, and large carriers only, can return a decent interest on the investment. The inevitable corollary is that speed and spirit are at a discount. There is no discussion of the fact that in the sailing merchant marine, the seamen, as a class, have sadly deteriorated. Men no longer sell farms to go to sea. But the time of which Dana writes was the heyday of fortune-making and adventure on the sea, with the full connotation of hardship and peril always attendant. It was Dana's fortune, for the sake of the picture, that the Pilgrim was an average ship, with an average crew and officers, and managed with average discipline. Even the hazing that took place after the California coast was reached was of the average sort. The Pilgrim savored not in any way of a hell-ship. The captain, while not the sweetest-natured man in the world, was only an average down-east driver, neither brilliant nor slovenly in his seamanship, neither cruel nor sentimental in the treatment of his men while on the one hand there were no extra liberty days, no delicacies added to the meager forecastle fare, nor grog or hot coffee on double watches. On the other hand, the crew were not chronically crippled by the continual play of knuckle-dusters and belaying pins. Once, and once only, were men flogged or ironed, a very fair average for the year 1834, for at that time flogging on board merchant vessels was already well on the decline. The difference between the sea life then and now can be no better epitomized than in Dana's description of the dress of the sailor of his day. The trousers tight around the hips, and thence hanging long and loose around the feet, a superabundance of checked shirt, a low-crowned, well-varnished black hat, worn on the back of the head, with half a fathom of black ribbon hanging over the left eye, and a peculiar tie to the black silk neckerchief. Though Dana sailed from Boston only three-quarters of a century ago, much that is at present obsolete was then in full sway. For instance, the old word larboard was still in use. He was a member of the larboard watch. The vessel was on the larboard tack. It was only the other day, because of its similarity in sound to starboard, that larboard was changed to port. 
try to imagine all larboard bowlines on deck being shouted down into the forecastle of a present-day ship. Yet that was the call used on the pilgrim to fetch Dana and the rest of his watch on deck. The chronometer, which is merely the least imperfect timepiece man has devised, makes possible the surest and easiest method by far of ascertaining longitude. Yet the pilgrim sailed in a day when the chronometer was just coming into general use. So literal was it depended upon that the pilgrim carried only one, and that one, going wrong at the outset, was never used again. A navigator of the present would be aghast if asked to voyage for two years from Boston around the Horn to California and back again without a chronometer. In those days such a proceeding was a matter of course, for those were the days when dead reckoning was indeed something to reckon on, when running down the latitude was a common way of finding a place, and when lunar observations were direly necessary. It may be fairly asserted that very few merchant officers of today ever make a lunar observation, and that a large percentage are unable to do it. September 22nd. Upon coming on deck at seven bells in the morning, we found the other watch aloft throwing water upon the sails, and looking astern we saw a small clipper-built brig with a black hull heading directly after us. We went to work immediately, and put all the canvas upon the brig, which we could get upon her rigging out oars for studding sail-yards, and contined wetting down the sails by buckets of water whipped up to the masthead. She was armed and full of men, and showed no colors. The foregoing sounds like a paragraph from Midshipman Easy, or The Water Witch, rather than a paragraph from the soberest, faithfulest, and most literal chronicle of the sea ever written. And yet the chase by a pirate occurred, on board the Brig Pilgrim, on September twenty second, 1834, something like only two generations ago. Dana was the thorough-going type of man, not overbalanced and erratic, without quirk or quibble of temperament. He was efficient, but not brilliant. His was a general all-around efficiency. He was efficient at the law. He was efficient at college. He was efficient as a sailor. He was efficient in the matter of pride, when that pride was no more than the pride of a foxhole hand at twelve dollars a month, and his seaman's task well done, in the smart sailing of his captain, in the clearness and trimness of his ship. There is no sailor whose cockles of the heart will not warm to Dana's description of the first time he sent down a royal yard. Once or twice he had seen it done. He got an old hand in the crew to coach him, and then, the first anchorage at Monterey being pretty thick with the second mate, he got him to ask the mate to be sent up the first time the royal yards were struck. Fortunately, as Dana describes it, I got through without any word from the officer, and heard the well done of the mate, when the yard reached the deck, with as much satisfaction as I ever felt at Cambridge on seeing a bean at the foot of a Latin exercise. This was the first time I had taken a weather earring, and I felt not a little proud to sit astride of the weather yard arm, pass the earring, and sing out, Haul on to leeward! He had been over a year at sea before he essayed this able seaman's task, but he did it and he did it with pride. And with pride he went down a four-hundred-foot cliff on a pair of top-gallant studding-sail halyards bent together, to dislodge several dollars' worth of stranded bullock hides, though all the acclaim he got from his mates was, What a damned fool you were to risk your life for half a dozen hides. In brief, it was just this efficiency and pride, as well as work, that enabled Dana to set down not merely the photographed detail of life before the mast, and hide-drogging on the coast of California, but of the untarnished simple psychology and ethics of the foxhole hens who drogged the hides, stood at the wheel, made and took in sail, tarred down the rigging, holly-stoned the decks, turned in all standing, grumbled as they cut about the kid, criticized the seamanship of their officers, and estimated the duration of their exile from the cubic space of the hide-house. Jack London Glen Ellen, California, August 13th, 1911. End of Section 6 A Classic of the Sea End of The Human Drift by Jack London